All right, is this thing on? It's on. Yay. All right. Hi. Uh, I'm back. <laughs> uh, first of all, I'm probably going to say Postgres instead of PostgreSQL, and there's a highly scientific study that was done that it results in a 32% performance improvement, so you should say Postgres too. Just FYI. <laughs> um, so a lot of what I tend to talk about, so my involvement in the Postgres community is I um, uh, do a lot of marketing actually for Postgres. Postgres is not a company. Um, we are a community of people, a collective of individuals um, spread out all over the world and there is not a single company that, that supports our development, but a lot of them. And we think right now that Postgres's role in the world is to disrupt the rest of the commercial database industry. Um, and we think those disruptive forces are licensing enterprise web development um, and the proprietary DBA career path, um, which I'm so glad there's someone from Oracle here today. Um, <laughs> uh, and some of the licensing issues that we're seeing right now, um, and there's been quite a large uptick in Postgres uh, adoption, which today having half of the room raise their hand saying that they were using Postgres was kind of amazing because typically, it, you know, I've been going to conferences, um, open source conferences for the last uh, about seven years, and it's, I've never seen so many hands raised, so it's really exciting for me. Um, but what we're finding is uh, commercial software developers that are creating closed source software are finding Postgres to be. Uh, an appropriate and useful drop-in replacement for something else that they're using. Um, that goes for something like uh, Oracle, it goes for something like um, DB2. Like People are really pursuing this um, because they don't have to pay the licensing costs. Um, we're seeing people adopt it kind of as a Skunk Works data warehousing tool that the D DBAs and companies can just like pull in and do whatever they want with because they didn't have to pay anything for it. Um, and also we're seeing quite a large upsurge in the people who are taking Postgres itself because it is BSD licensed, adopting it and then you know selling it as a product, uh, which is kind of exciting. A colleague of mine gave a talk about all of the different forks of PostgreSQL that are out there and um, there's a lot, uh, more than 40. So um, we're also seeing a lot of enterprise-y web development for in-house stuff, like I was saying. Postgres um, has so many extensions, um, and we really encourage that as part of the use of the database. Um, we are the database of choice for Django, which, again, has resulted in a lot of new users for us, which is great. Um, and we've found also that Oracle did a great job of marketing itself to uh, things like PHP developers. Um, and then those developers feel less scared when they encounter Postgres in the end. And it just cracked me up. Um, the other day I was looking at Oracle's website, you know, and some of their marketing for open source developers. Uh, and they really were like really pushing the PHP uh, more so than Ruby or Python, which I thought was just really interesting. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is that companies are not able to hire Postgres DBAs fast enough. It's really hard to hire anybody right now, but in particular, people are having a lot of trouble. Um, and what they're doing instead is hiring Oracle DBAs and retraining them. Uh, and we don't really have a great uh, way to train people in Postgres itself. We don't have a certification program, so typically it's like taking an Oracle DBA, sitting them in front of a terminal with a manual, and letting them go. Um, but we're, we're seeing this more and more because companies just can't hire fast enough and find them. Um, and what the Oracle DBAs are saying to us is that we do a few things better, which is really encouraging. Um, and so we're seeing people join our community from the Oracle side and we're learning things from them. Um, and the other thing is that for the last five years we've had a major release with an incredible amount of functionality every single year. Um, there are people, I'm not recommending that you do this, but there are people that just take our uh, current uh, Git repo and just compile straight from head <laughs> and use that in production um, because we have such a reputation for fixing bugs and being incredibly stable. Um, and I don't know, has anybody here ever reported a Postgres bug? And has it been fixed? How long did it take? 
yeah, I didn't plant him really. Um, so we have these like couple people in our community that uh, have really devoted their lives to addressing the bugs in the in the database, and the typical turnaround is something like 48 hours. So anyway, I'm going to try to do a live demo. This is going to be really awesome. Uh, sorry, I need my other hand. Kill the, oh yeah, yeah, you can't see that very well. Hold on. Okay, so basically what I'm going to show you is how our binary replication is set up. Um, this is something that's been incredibly difficult uh, in Postgres for a long time. And I don't have any of you here ever set it up? Got a couple here. Have any of you ever tried and failed? <laughs> <laughs> <This view. laughs> yeah, um, sorry to out you as like fail, but anyway, um, uh, it is difficult. Uh, it, uh, it was difficult, um, and things have improved dramatically. I'm actually compiling a version of this is a current snapshot of our development tree, um, so this is what's going to be available in 9.2, and that release will probably happen uh, somewhere around. July, August time frame, but I'm guessing that there will be um, uh, an alpha or a beta just within the next month or so. So um, you could download a binary uh, relatively soon and run this yourself. Um, but, you know, the basics of it are you create a master database. Um, I create a well storage directory. Um, you update your HBA. Host-based authentication is what that stands for. It's kind of old school, but you set up replication user access, um, and then you update your PostgreSQL.conf with a few different settings. Um, this is fairly well documented in the wiki, but I also pushed this repo into GitHub, so you could download this and run this yourself on your laptop or something if you wanted. Um, you start up the Postgres master, because like I said, we still haven't kind of fixed that yet. There's some issues with not starting the database and then trying to replicate immediately. Um, and then we have this new tool called PG Base Backup, a friend of mine wrote, and it's awesome. It solves so many of the problems with creating uh, binary backups with Postgres. It does everything. You notice there aren't very many command line switches here. I'm giving it a user, but I really don't have to. And it kind of just does everything correctly. Uh, almost everybody that I know that has worked with Postgres has written their own base backup script. Um, and then down below, we have a few settings for setting up the hot standby. You turn it on. Um, and then here's a recovery.conf um, that instructs the database on how it's going to replay the binary uh, replication uh, packets as they're coming across. And here's the connection info locally. Um, yep, some more settings, blah, blah, blah. You start the replication. Um, and then the other, the other thing that I wanted to show you today is that we actually have cascaded slave binary replication um, in 9.2. Uh, and uh, MySQL has had <laughs> these types of features for a long time. <laughs> and we finally have it. Um, and it's really cool. It's awesome. You could do it before with uh, trigger-based replication. But again, this is, this is built into core. Uh, so anyway, so blah, blah, blah. I set that up, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'm all done. So now this is really going to work, I promise. So it's doing the init, starting the server. Now I'm making the base backup. I created a database just to prove that I could do it. Um, and then there's the output from PS showing that I've got all of these individual Postgres instances running. Um, and then have a little, uh, let's see. So then if you log into PSQL, um, and then I think I maybe have, oh yeah. You can see there my replication is going, which is pretty exciting. Um, and here I am just replicating from a master to one slave. And then on the slave, I'm replicating from that slave to two cascaded slaves. So there's that guy. Oops, sorry. Doing this with one hand is tricky. 
And then if I go to the slave, you can see I've got two cascaded slaves. And my demo worked. Ah, awesome. Um, the other thing is that we, this is now, um, for those of you who are familiar with previous incarnations of Postgres replication, you used to have to do wall shipping, which was 16 megabyte files um, that you would have to copy from system to system and then replay them. Now we do streaming replication, so essentially about when um, a transaction commits, it can be then copied over to the slave. Um, we also do synchronous replication, so there's, uh, you know, it copies to the slave and then it does a, hey master, I got a copy of that data, it's good, and saved. Um, and that's pretty much automatic. The only change that you have to make to the configuration is to give a name <laughs> to the synchronous replication target and then tell the slave what the name is. Um, that's the only change to the configuration. So it's very simple to set up. Uh, and what's really awesome about it too is that it has built-in things for detecting when things get out of sync. Um, and so if you have multiple slaves connected to a single master, it'll detect that something's out of sync and then promote someone else to be um, in uh, synchronous after that. Uh, so there's a lot of really neat features um, for high availability with Postgres, which is the point of this talk, um, that are that uh, are available now. Um, and there are certain vendors that are uh, aggressively pursuing implementing this now, like Heroku. I don't work for them or anything, but they they um, they've done a lot of work to make uh, replication be essentially transparent um, using our binary replication tools. And there are other companies that are pursuing uh, making tools to support this so that you could even have your own kind of private clustered uh, Postgres instances as, as commercial products. But our tools, the tools are there now. Um, uh, all the open source tools are there now for you to set something like this up yourself. Um, so I have a little, a few more slides. How am I doing on time? Yeah, go ahead. Question, yeah. Just repeat the question? Okay, yeah. ah, cool. Um, so uh, w one thing, um, when we do synchronous replication, yeah. is it always all or nothing? As in, if I have uh, three slaves, can I say, uh, consider this transaction completed if it's been written to two, but I don't care which ones? Um, and then do the third one asynchronously? I'd have to look and see what current state of head is. I know that that is a feature that Simon Riggs wanted okay. to support. Um, I'm not positive at what stage it is. Okay. And second question, since this, you said this is basically binary streaming replication, not statement-based. That's correct. So when does the sync happen? Does it happen on an actual insert and update, or does it happen on the commit? What's the consistency guarantee there? Um, so the consistency guarantee is about the uh, committed transaction. So um, once on the master you commit a change, um, if it's sync wrap, then it is not considered committed in your cluster until it reaches the slave and then is copied back. The, the commit, yeah. Okay, so if I, have, if I have one synchronously replicated slave, yes. I issue a commit, for whatever reason that commit fails on the slave, then yes. that transaction is considered failed. Exactly. And if the slave croaks at that very moment, as in just stops responding, uh, then again, that transaction is considered failed. Is that correct? That's correct. Awesome. Yep. Okay. One more question. Is the on received on the slave or on this? Uh, the question was, is the sync uh, on received or is it on uh, to disk? Uh, that is configurable. Yeah, and there's actually a lot of nuance in there that I'd happy to talk about later. Because <laughs> um, one, one of the more surprising behaviors in previous, in 9.0 version of Postgres was that um, committed on the slave did not mean visible. And so if you had an application that was relying on commit me being visible, you had to add an extra configuration to make that happen. Uh, but I believe at this point, the default has changed. So it's less surprising to users. <laughs> I like the policy of least surprise. Look, I didn't have to use my screenshots. Yay. <laughs> okay, so replication is hard, sharding's hard, things are slow. 
Um, <laughs> I think that the streaming cascaded replication, which is new in 9.2, is really great. Um, and it's, it's solving a lot of this issue of, of replication for Postgres. Sharding's still really hard. Um, you have to often change the way that application developers think uh, in order to get this to work properly. Um, and then some other things that we're working on, we now have index-only scans in Postgres. Again, something that other databases have had for a long time and we finally have implemented to our satisfaction. And what this basically means is that if you create indexes on tables in Postgres, now you can access that data in memory. Um, there's some caveats with that, but in, in certain cases, I mean, it's it's so clearly a huge performance win. It's, um, people are very excited about this. Um, the other thing about our community is that we're really starting to address operations and performance concerns that um, DBAs have had for a really long time. Uh, sorry, this is in all caps, but um, uh, you can now do certain things like like this one. You're altering the type of an index column, and maybe you don't want to re-index right that second. Um, so you can de delay or defer changes uh, to important uh, pieces of data in the database uh, in a way that really helps people maintain uh, reasonable performance. Um, you can also implement additional checks on, on data, um, either rules or, or triggers, and say that uh, existing data in an index could be maybe not valid for that check, but that doesn't mean that it's going to recompute an index. Sorry, that was a little out there. But anyway, the bottom line is, is that that's really great for DBAs. Um, and there's a, a, a great deal of focus right now on these types of issues. So if you're a person that kind of waved around and like set, sent an email to hackers in the past and said, ah, like why don't you fix this like really annoying problem for me as a DBA, now would be a really good time to bring up those issues again. Um, the other thing is PG-based backup. It's, uh, it's creating a, a common starting point uh, for people who are doing backups for Postgres. Um, I think I already said this in the other one. Um, when, one goal uh, for me is to try to make Postgres as easy to install as SQLite. Big goal. <laughs> but there are people that are working on this right now, improving, improving InitDB. Um, and what's happening right now, I already mentioned Heroku. They're doing 400 million write transactions per day. This is probably the largest, uh, you know, cluster of Postgres out there in the world. Um, VMware is creating really great software um, for managing lots of instances of Postgres. There are lots of other vendors that are working on things right now. Um, and there's just, in general, a lot more interest in the hosting world in supporting Postgres, uh, which has uh, not necessarily been true five years ago. Uh, like I said, some of the things that we're working on, UI overhaul, um, there's a lot of work to be done there, uh, cascaded failover, and finally um, there's, there's been work on using, uh, changing synchronous rep into a multi-master system um, that can have multiply cascaded slaves. So um, that's kind of far off in the future, I'd say, you know, two or three years really before we have a significant amount of code to support that, but that's, that's on the roadmap for the people who are working on this code right now, and it's really exciting. So, thank you. Um, so, we're at um, um, another break time, um, but if anybody has any questions, um, we can do that. Um, after the break, uh, Monty, Monty Taylor is going to be talking about Swift 101, um, and Ian is going to be talking about something. Infrastructure Web infrastructure scaling and keeping it online cheaply. And right after that, there's um, uh, two lightning talks. If anybody else wants to give one, um, please do. There's little notes down here. Um, so.